Hello, everyone. Jennifer? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now, thanks. Go ahead. Okay, I'm gonna start. Hello, everyone. I'm Jennifer Daw, and welcome to today's webinar, which is hosted by the Clean Energy Solutions Center in partnership with the Organization of American States and Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Today's webinar is focused on the finding new, res finding new synergies between water and energy. Next slide. Before we begin, I'll quickly go over some of the webinar features. For audio, you have two options. You may either listen through your computer or over your telephone. If you choose to listen through your computer, please select the mic and speakers option in the audio pane. If you choose to dial in by phone, please select the telephone option and a box on the right side will display the telephone number and audio pin you should use to dial in. If anyone is having technical difficulties with the webinar, you may contact the GoToWebinars help desk at 888-259-3826 for assistance. If you'd like to ask a question, we ask that you use the questions pane where you may type in a question. The audio recording and presentations will be posted to the Solution Center training page within a few days of the broadcast and will be added to the Solution Center YouTube channel where you will find other informative webinars as well as video interviews with thought leaders on clean energy policy topics. Finally, one important note of mention before we begin our presentation is that the Clean Energy Solutions Center does not endorse or recommend specific products or services. Information provided in this webinar is featured in the Solutions Center Resource Library as one of many best practice resources reviewed and selected by technical experts. Today's webinar agenda is centered around the presentations from our guest panelists, Juan Cruz Monticelli, Maha Haji, and Neil Aronson, who have joined us to discuss ways to integrate existing proven technologies into sustainable systems that can provide access to fresh water, generate green electricity, and manage renewable energy intermittency. Before we jump into the presentation, I'll provide a quick overview of the Solution Center, as well as the Solution Center's work on the energy water food nexus. Then, following the panelists' presentations, we will have a question and answer session where the panelists will address questions submitted by the audience. At the end of the webinar, you will be automatically prompted to fill out a brief survey as well. So thank you in advance for taking a moment to respond to this. All right. The Solution Center was launched in 2011 under the Clean Energy Ministerial. The Clean Energy Ministerial is a high-level global forum to promote policies and programs that advance clean energy technology, to share lessons learned and best practices, and to encourage the transition to a global clean energy economy. 24 countries and the European Commission are members, contributing 90% of clean energy investment and responsible for 75% of global greenhouse gas emissions. This webinar is provided by the Clean Energy Solutions Center which focuses on helping government policymakers design and adopt policies and programs that support the deployment of clean energy technology. This is accomplished through support in crafting and implementing policies relating to energy access, no-cost expert policy assistance, and peer-to-peer -peer learning and training tools, such as this webinar. The Clean Energy Solutions Center is co-sponsored by the governments of Australia, United States, and has in-kind support from the government of Chile. The Solution Center provides several clean energy policy programs and services, including a team of over 60 global experts that can provide remote and in-person technical assistance to governments and government-supported institutions, no-cost virtual webinar trainings on a variety of clean energy topics, partnership building with development agencies, and regional and global organizations to deliver support. An online library containing over 5,500 clean energy policy related publications, tools, videos, and other resources. Our primary audience is made up of energy policymakers and analysts from governments and technical organizations in all countries, but we also strive to engage with the private sector, NGOs, and civil society.
The Solution Center is an international initiative that works with more than 35 international partners across a suite of different programs. Several of the partners are listed above and include organizations like the Organization of American States, the Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Partnership, and the International Energy Agency, programs like Sustainable Energy for All, and regionally focused entities such as CARICOM and OLADE. A marquee feature that the Solution Center provides is the no-cost expert policy assistance known as X in Expert. The Ask an Expert service matches policymakers with more than 60 global experts selected as authoritative leaders on specific clean energy finance and policy topics. For example, in the area of energy, water, and food, we're very pleased to have Olivier Dubois from the United Nations Food and Agriculture Association serving as one of our experts. If you have a need for policy assistance in the area of water, energy, and food nexus, or any other clean energy sector, we encourage you to use this valuable service. Again, the assistance is provided free of charge. If you have a question for our experts, please submit it through our simple online form at cleanenergysolutions.org forward slash experts. We also invite you to spread the word about this service to those in your networks and organizations. As an example of some recent energy water activities the Solution Center has performed, the Solution Center recently developed a web portal on the energy water food nexus with funding from the Commonwealth of Australia. The purpose of this portal is to provide a single access point for information on policy best practices, models, and tools to help support the energy water food nexus. The focus of the portal is to educate policymakers worldwide about the importance, drivers, challenges, and opportunities associated with the energy water food nexus. And the portal also contains a curated resource library on energy water food nexus topics arranged by sector and identifies opportunities for improved integration. Please check it out at the link shown on this slide. Next slide. One other request that the Solution Center recently assisted with, the Solution Center worked with British Virgin Islands Electricity Corporation to perform analysis to inform a recently passed energy policy with targets to reduce fossil fuel use and explore the possibility of renewable energy hybrid systems. This analysis used the REOPT tool to find the most cost optimal approach to optimize existing reverse osmosis desalination system operations using renewable energy and diesel fuel to generate power and to treat water on a remote island. The results of the study showed it would be economically favorable to add 400 to 500 kilowatts of PV or solar power, reducing diesel 20 to 40% of the time. In addition, the Solution Center also supported British Virgin Islands in understanding cost effectiveness of power purchase agreements for solar power and how the renewable energy market development through feed and tariffs. Now I'd like to provide brief introductions for today's panelists. First up today is Juan Cruz Monticelli, who is the Section Chief for the Department of Sustainable Development at the Organization of American States. Following Juan, we will hear from Maha Haji, who is a PhD in Mechanical Engineering at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Our final panelist today is Neil Aronson, who is the co-founder, president, and CEO of Oceanus Power and Water. And with those brief introductions, I would like to welcome Juan to the webinar. Thank you for this in introduction. So let me set up my presentation. Do I have control over it now? Yes, okay. So I work at the Organization of American States, uh, where we implement a program called Energy and Climate Partnership of the Americas. And uh, we're focused basically on promoting shared leadership uh, in the field of uh, clean energy, renewable energy. Uh, our activities are focused on seven pillars, which you can see on the screen. And basically uh, what ECBA is, is a hemispheric forum for low carbon growth and for a free discussion among uh, the countries in the Americas yeah. on energy. Juan, Juan Cruz, can yes. I interrupt? I, I'm not able to see your screen. Are the other panelists able to see Juan Cruz's screen? 
no, I can't. No. Oh, now yeah. we see it. Now we see it. Thank okay. you. All right, back to me. Apologies for that. So, so Energy and Climate Partnership of the Americas, uh, and it uh, basically functions as a hemispheric forum for low carbon economic growth. And basically, uh, what ECBA provi provides to the member states of the Organization of American States, uh, which includes all countries in the Americas from the United States and Canada all the way down to Chile and Argentina, is this forum where they can freely discuss these ideas, always revolving about this concept of low carbon eco economic growth and especially clean energy. Uh, a couple of years ago, we set up our steering committee comprised of nine countries, uh, as you can see them on the screen, and these countries uh, basically lead or steer the partnership, uh, propose ideas, uh, promote events, uh, suggest an action plan, and lead overall the, 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 the partnership. Our areas of focus, we're focusing mostly, as I was saying before, on shared leadership in clean energy. And also we implement uh, a set of activities, especially in the field of metrology uh, slash um, measurement sciences for sustainable energy technologies. We also support our Caribbean member states in, in their approach toward uh, uh, sustainable energy and energy security. And we work heavily on energy efficiency, especially with the countries in Central America and, the Dominica, and with the Dominican Republic. We have a ministerial process. Our first ministerial took place in 2010 uh, here in Washington, D.C., followed by uh, two uh, ministerials, one in Mexico, another in Chile. And we are working now towards the fourth ministerial in partnership with the government of Jamaica. Now, why, why is it that the OAS, a forum that is mostly dedicated to democracy, human rights, security, and development, is interested in the water energy uh, nexus. Why is it important for us? And what we see is that um, there is a lot happening in the field of energy. Every day we have news about the price of oil, about new technologies being discovered, about uh, the, the scarcity of uh, water resources, about the lack of access to energy. And we realize that these elements uh, uh, in a way, it can conspire against strong democracies, against uh, a real access, a meaningful access to human rights. So we see that there is an interconnection between uh, this nexus that we speak so much about and the four pillars of our organization. So that's why we, we focus so much on this issue. And if we look at the numbers, again, we can see that energy poverty uh, is an endemic problem in some regions. Latin America has evolved a lot in this field. Uh, we've done a lot of good work, but we see other parts in the world where you know energy access remains an issue, both uh, when we spoke about electricity, but also clean cooking uh, fuels and, and other fuels. So and we if you look at we dig a little bit deeper and we look at the water issue, no, and we see you know 70% of our planet is covered with water. Right. But what does that, that mean? I mean, if we look at it, then really 97.5% of that water is salt water. So it's not um, apt for human use. So we are really are talking about 2.5% of fresh water resources available for human consumption, of which we really have only 30% which can be uh, used because those glaciers and permanent snow covers and uh, polar ice caps we want to keep those safe. We really actually don't want them to melt at all because that's the problem with global warming, actually. So, so really, uh, the, the amount of fresh water available for human consumption and human uses is very, very small. So we got to make a very uh, rational use of those resources. And if we look at uh, the global challenge of energy and water, well, then we see billions of people really who have not access to, to, to reliable access to electricity or living in areas where uh, uh, water stresses are high. So we see this issue and we see this, this interconnection, these interactions between water and energy, water for energy, but also uh, energy for water and how uh, each process uh, involving water for human consumption uh, demands energy and at the same time if you want to produce energy, well, you're going to need water at some point in the process. So it turns almost, it looks almost as if it, without the right tools, you know, we look at water and energy and it can become a zero sum game. 
where a gain for one side entails a loss for the other side. And this is really not the way to look at it. And governments have been very effective at putting together um, policy policies and regulations and uh, legislation to avoid this, this uh, vision of water energy, this zero-sum game. This is not what we want. What we really want is to look at uh, water and energy in a holistic way. Uh, and then we implement, our governments implement uh, proper policy and regulation. And then even at the international level, we have this fora for discussion. And then this is when you know, water and energy really become a non-zero-sum game, and a gain for one side is not offset by a loss for the other side, and that's where the nexus lives. So I'm going to stop right there. Um, you know, I was talking about the policy solutions and the regulations, but there are also technological and technical solutions with existing proven technologies, and I think this is a little bit of what we will hear today from our friends at MIT and Oceanus. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Juan. I'm just going to make this. There we go. Can you see my screen OK? Um, so hi, my name is Maha Haji, and I'll be talking about um, a solution we've developed um, in this water energy nexus space at MIT called the Integrated Pumped Hydro Reverse Osmosis System, or IFROS. Um, so the premise behind IFROS was that renewable energy systems are often quite intermittent and require a lot of storage to be successful. Um, so a lot of people use batteries to achieve that, um, to level out that intermittency. But we believe that pumped hydro systems actually can be very robust. Um, they're quite a mature technology, quite efficient, and are, are pretty uh, economical. Um, and they have over 80% round trip efficiency, can operate for th tens of thousands of cycles, and their optimal hydraulic head is about 500 to 700 meters. Looking at fresh water generation by reverse osmosis, which is also a mature and widely used technology, um, this also is uh, ideal at 500 to 700 meters head. Um, the issue with reverse osmosis is that large, costly pumps are usually required to achieve this level of pressure. Um, and the brine outflow, what outflows from the reverse osmosis system, is a very concentrated solution of salts. Um, and that can harm the environment. So it usually needs to be mixed with some amount of fresh water before it can be, um, or, or water without any salts, before it can be put back into the ocean. So at MIT, we had the idea of, um, given that these two have similar head requirements, pressure requirements, what if we could pair them together and create a symbiosis between hydroenergy and reverse osmosis desalination? Another impetus for this was that many drought-stricken coastal regions actually have nearby mountains that could offer sufficient elevation to support the right um, pressure required for the reverse osmosis. And combining systems to produce uh, energy um, reduces capital investments related to such things as those expensive pump costs and it solves the problem of the brine disposal for desalination because you can imagine that we can split the streams of water, one going straight to reverse osmosis and one going through turbines to produce energy. One going through reverse osmosis would produce a brine solution which then can be remixed with the outflow of the turbines which is a, a much more dilute solution. Um, and uh, seawater hydro has actually been done successfully in the past. Um, this is a plant I'm showing here in Japan um, that uses hydro storage using pumped seawater. So there are systems in place that are proven that this can be done on a large scale using seawater uh, for hydro storage. And we came up with the idea to combine it with desalination. So how might this system work? Um, so as I mentioned, um, you would have a mountaintop reservoir that would hold enough water that could per be diverted into two streams, one for um, reverse osmosis to produce fresh water and another to produce electricity through um, turbines. And the power used to pump up that water initially to the mountaintop um, we envision would also be renewable energy, something like um, photovoltaics or wind or, e or um, uh, perhaps even wave energy at some someday. So 
this would essentially work as a giant battery for the renewable energy systems. Um, we have a, I have a link here to our paper if you'd like to learn a little bit more about our methodology. But to give you an overview, just 21 cubic meters of seawater is enough to produce 50 kilowatt hours of electricity and 500 liters of fresh water. And with a one kilometer square lake at a height of six, 600 meters, we can provide the power and freshwater needs for a million people. And these are uh, achievable numbers. Um, and I'll show you our methodology. Um, you can envision that this, what a full solution might look like is that you have power uh, from renewables at the top of the reservoir, such as wind and solar. You could even grow fresh food uh, from the water if you need nearby. Um, you could, you know, everyone loves a lake. Why not include some kind of themed resort around the lake, get another um, revenue stream through tourism. Um, we could have factories nearby that make the renewable energy uh, that for or use the renewable energy for to make products and, and sales. Um, and we could have all of our basically all of our energy system right in the mountain top. And at the bottom, you could even perhaps have um, some sort of shellfish farming or aquaculture farming um, to produce some kind of food source. There's also been suggestions that the brine that comes out of the reverse osmosis has a lot of valuable metals such as lithium, cobalt, um, and perhaps we could extract some of that instead of mining it out, of, which is a quite a dirty process. Um, so we looked at um, where in the world might this actually work. And to do that, we came up with a geographic assessment called the I index. This is basically the storage potential of any mountaintop reservoir divided by its distance to the coast. So this takes into things such as the reservoir elevation, its depth and um, surface area, et cetera. And we took a look at all places around the world, and I'll give you one example, um, just looking at uh, the city of Iquique, Chile, which uh, is suffering from drought. There's a number of regions nearby that have quite high um, eye indexes and energy uh, potential. So I've highlighted some of them here. Red means that it's um, a high eye index, and blue means it's quite low. So you, you can see um, region A is pretty close by, and could afford a lot of opportunity to the city of Iquique. And we looked at other places in the world, and this is just a snapshot. This is also available in our paper. We have a big appendix of all the different case studies we looked at. And in the blue is the I index of the location, and the red is the energy potential. And you can see countries across the world, just on our, our brief overview survey, have this kind of potential. Chile, the United States, both in, at Hawaii and California, Iran, Peru, China, Brazil, um, just to name a few. Mexico has quite a number as well. Um, so with that, I'd like to leave you and, and thank you for your time. And um, I believe Neil from Oceanus is actually going to take us through how you might actually develop one of these systems specifically for Mexico. And if you'd like more information, um, feel free to check out our paper. Thank you. Hi, this is Neil Aarons, and uh, thank you very much, Dr. Haji and our uh, panelists, uh, Juan Cruz, and everyone for for joining us today and participating. Uh, I want to share with you a little bit about uh, my firm, Oceanus Power and Water, and how we are uh, commercializing the, the idea of IFROS uh, throughout uh, the world uh, is our goal. Uh, we've started in, in Mexico, in the state of Sonora. Um, I, a little background to begin. Um, Oceanus was, was founded in 2014, 2015. Um, we're based in uh, the city of Palo Alto, California, which is in the heart of the Silicon Valley um, by a, a bunch of uh, energy and, uh, and infrastructure developers uh, such as myself. Um, we actually uh, envisioned the idea of EFROS and, and started to commercialize the concept um, uh, almost concurrently with uh, Dr. Haji and Dr. Slocum, um, but independently, really. We, we, we started to, to look at these opportunities uh, as solutions for the problems that we have here, particularly in California, with a high growth of uh, solar uh, and wind. Um, uh, 
Uh, we here in California have also been reducing the amount of fossil generation that we have, uh, gas, coal, and so forth. Uh, we've also been uh, decommissioning our, our nuclear plants uh, here in California. And so we have a, a high growth of renewables, um, a decline of our base load uh, fossil generation. And the question really became uh, very urgent. How do you manage this transition to a clean energy economy uh, without, uh, without creating uh, massive disruptions to your economy? And so um, the idea of pump storage, as, uh, as Dr. Haji suggested, uh, it, it, pump storage is uh, the leader in uh, energy storage throughout the world. It's been around for decades. It's proven. It's bankable. It's environmentally uh, benign uh, relative to, to other uh, energy storage solutions. Um, it has a tremendously long life. Um, and so for, for all of those reasons, it, it is, from our perspective, the only energy solution for grid scale uh, applications. Uh, batteries have a wonderful place in the world, um, but at this level, they don't, uh, they don't have the costs or functional components to, to be able to, to address global uh, grid scale energy storage needs. Um, integrating the the idea of a of a pump storage facility and specifically a seawater pump storage facility with a seawater desalination um, seemed uh, seemed logical to us uh, and so we engaged a, a large multinational engineering firm to uh, to to look at the integration um, right around that time we 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 ran into Dr. Slocum and Dr. Haji and their team working on, on this same concept and, uh, and, a, and a great collaboration was formed. Um, we see the, the transformative impacts of, of integrating clean energy with energy storage and fresh water. Um, and as my, uh, my fellow panelists have, have mentioned before, uh, this can be a tremendous uh, impact, a positive impact on, on regions, particularly coastal regions with large populations in semi-arid parts of the world. Uh, we've done uh, a, a number of innovations um, to the idea that uh, Dr. Haji just explained. Um, we believe uh, our solution is uh, uh, more commercially viable. Uh, we've reduced the cost dramatically um, and we believe we've, we can scale the solution to, to fit even more locations um, uh, globally. Uh, than, than uh, Dr. Haji's study has, has identified. Um, we only need approximately 250 to 300 meters of, of elevation or head uh, for, a, for a reservoir. Uh, and we also have eliminated the, uh, the boring or the drilling or tunneling of the, of the pipes or penstocks between the, uh, the reservoir and the powerhouse, which dramatically reduces the cost of the uh, of the system. Uh, so, based on our analysis, uh, we believe we are the we can provide the lowest cost of energy storage and the lowest cost of produced water available on the market today. Um, what we have here is a is a brief or uh, a, a very simple rendering of of the solution. Um, as, as you saw in previous versions, um, you can uh, mix renewables from the, from, from the upper elevation or really anywhere around you in the, from the grid. This is a grid connected system. Uh, so you can either self gen uh, re renewables such as solar or wind, or, or you can purchase uh, solar or wind from, from projects uh, surrounding the, the, the EFROS facility. Um, conveyance for, for water um, is fairly uh, simple technologies of, of pipes and, and pumps uh, to move the water into the, uh, the regional water system. So uh, again, there, there's no technology risk here per se. Um, it's all a matter of integrating existing technologies, bankable technologies, proven technologies, and more importantly, for certain parts of the world that are prone for to storms or, or tsunamis or hurricanes, uh, these are resilient technologies that are, are uh, better suited to survive um, storms like we saw in, in the Caribbean that ravaged Puerto Rico um, this past year. 
uh, this kind of a system um, uh, can result can 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 survive those kind of events, and more importantly, um, black start or or start the system up again um, after uh, some kind of event has has occurred, which is a, a particularly unique characteristic of pump storage. Oops. Uh, we do believe there are tremendous environmental uh, benefits of this kind of a system um, over traditional or, or I should say other uh, energy storage uh, systems um, as well as ener uh, other uh, seawater reverse osmosis or desalination systems. Um, the, the brine discharge, as Dr. Haji mentioned, is, uh, is a tremendous benefit over existing uh, desalination systems. Currently, desal globally just in, ejects, injects the brine back into the ocean um, with, with relatively minimal dilution and relies on um, tides and wave action to dilute the, the, the brine. The brine itself is a is a heavy salinity um, mix and sinks typically sinks to the bottom of of the the marine ecosystem uh, and effectively covers every type of organism or coral or so forth on the bottom um, and and uh, and has a devastating effect. It kills it kills basically whatever it's lying on top of. So it's a it's a very uh, damaging. Uh, 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 Injection into the marine uh, ecosystem that um, that that is is very difficult and costly to remedy um, unless you have a system like Efros where you can blend the brine directly into the outflow of the pump storage facility. And based on our calculations, uh, we're able to blend that brine before discharge, blend it down to within five or ten percent of amb ambient salinity levels. Um, so this this uh, type of of mixing um, uh, really enables that brine to to become benign by the time it's uh, e ejected into the marine ecosystem and uh, and 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 starts to interact with the, with the environment. Um, California here in the United States has a very stringent ocean plan. Uh, it's called the California Ocean Plan, and it it tightly regulates. Um, discharges into the ocean, um, which has had a, a, a detrimental uh, impact on the development of desalination in California. Uh, as you would imagine, California has a tremendous problem with, with uh, population growth and water supplies uh, and, uh, and has, has, has had some very dramatic uh, drought and groundwater uh, issues over the last uh, 10 years. Um, and yet we don't have very many desalination plants. And uh, the ocean plan and the, and the regulatory environment here in California has made that very difficult. Um, EFROS and our solution uh, are, are really the only um, solution for desal that, that complies with the ocean plan uh, as, it's, uh, as, as it exists today. So, so it's, we are the only solution that, that can, can address these type of concerns. Um, that regulators are starting to express here in California and the United States, and, and we, we understand that other parts of the world are, are looking at these type of regulations as well. Uh, the head that, that Dr. Haji mentioned uh, is a tremendous uh, uh, driver of the energy reduction uh, as part of the, of the system. Um, we, you're effectively using very efficient uh, 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 reverse reverse turbines or uh, pump turbines. I'm sorry, as they're referred to, pump turbines to move the water up the hill. Um, they they pump storage by its very nature is an, is typically an arbitrage arbitrage play. You buy cheap energy to move the water up the hill with very efficient pump turbines, and then you 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 discharge the the water down the hill uh, when you can sell more expensive energy. Um, but the nature of that that process allows you to uh, take that low cost uh, energy and in the water and then re return it down through the desalination plant uh, and reduce the amount of energy needed um, as well as having a lower cost energy uh, uh, for use in the desalination plant and our calculations 
show that you can reduce the uh, the energy footprint for from convert conventional uh, desalination by 40 to 60 percent. Which, if you're familiar with desalination, you know that the energy cost of a desalination plant represents somewhere between 40 to 50 percent of the ongoing operational cost of the desal plant, and they are depending on the size, they can be tremendously large uh, energy hogs, uh, energy users. And so this is a dramatic uh, impact on the, the, the cost of desal uh, for these kind of projects. Uh, when you use uh, renewable energy such as wind or PV, uh, you also reduce those air, air emissions associated with desal. And that has a, also a tremendous benefit for uh, greenhouse gas and, and, and global warming issues. So when you bring all of this together, uh, you, you are able to uh, realize tremendous CapEx savings because you're using common infrastructure. Um, you're, we've been able to innovate the reduction of, of um, costs associated with, with the construction of, pen, of, of pump storage um, and, and ultimately realizing you know, very significant CapEx savings uh, by by co-locating and integrating these facilities. Um, as I mentioned, the operating savings of these facilities can be very dramatic, and, and as I said, uh, allowing our facilities to deliver the lowest cost uh, energy storage and the lowest cost uh, produced water, desalinated water on the market. So it's a, it, it really has a tremendous impact on the economics um, of these systems, and ultimately uh, that, that relates directly to benefits to um, to a wide number of markets globally that that um, uh, need economic growth and development. Uh, the technical advantages, as uh, Dr. Haji mentioned, of pump storage, uh, the, their their dispatchable uh, systems. Um, they provide the grid the grid with rotating equipment, which uh, as you as you transition from uh, fossil systems of uh, whether it's a uh, gas or oil or or coal um, to renewables, uh, the grid still needs rotating equipment for stability, for grid stability uh, uh, functionality, and and pump storage uh, enables that. Um, so you, it's a tremendously valuable uh, what's called ancillary service uh, for the grid that. Um, uh, that, that's unique. Other energy storage systems are not able to do that. Um, pump storage today is a very fast response times. Um, the pump turbines uh, that are being implemented today uh, globally um, are, are tremendously more uh, advanced and innovative than some of the systems that have been in place for years. Um, they allow for variable speeds, uh, super fast start, super fast uh, change, of, uh, from load to gen, uh, and ultimately are, are, are tremendous assets for for grids uh, as we migrate from from fossil to renewable uh, sources. Um, you may have heard of the duck curve that California has been experiencing uh, as its transition to renewables. Um, this is really a result of over generation of solar during the middle of the day. Um, Ultimately, if you don't manage the duck curve with, with grid scale uh, economic storage, uh, you end up dumping uh, a tremendous amount or what's called curtailing a tremendous amount of, of solar in the middle of the day. And that's already happening here in California. Uh, we're in fact giving solar energy away in the middle of the day to some of the surrounding states like Arizona and Nevada. And uh, obviously that, that has a, a detrimental impact on the economics of, of many of these projects. So our solution, uh, we're, we're starting the development of a project in, in the state of Sonora, Mexico, uh, on the Sea of Cortez. Uh, we believe there are a number of uh, opportunities uh, for EFROS uh, to be developed um, throughout Latin America. Uh, we're looking uh, very carefully at Chile, at Peru, um, other parts of, of Central America, Panama, and so forth. Um, we believe that there there are opportunities and, and, and needs really for for these communities to to develop uh, economically viable resilience uh, sources of of new water and energy storage. 
as I mentioned, uh, our solution has a has a uh, minimal environmental impact. Um, it, we were able to provide water and uh, resilient uh, new supplies for where certain areas in the world and and Latin America where the water can be scarce uh, or, um, or 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 existing sources are stretched between human and environmental and agricultural purposes. Um, the systems themselves are very flexible, uh, and it helps facilitate the transition to a to a uh, renewable energy, clean energy economy with zero emissions. Um, they're very long term and low cost uh, facilities, infrastructure facilities, uh, which I think are a, a, a tremendous need right now. As as you hear a lot of a lot of information about batteries um, as a solution for energy storage. What they don't tell you is that they're not very long term uh, or low cost, and so ultimately uh, they're not the right solutions for many, many parts of the world. The project in Sonora is uh, is located, as I mentioned, on the Sea of Cortez. The, the Sonora is largely a desert, but it is also a, um, a fairly significant um, industrial state uh, for the for the country of Mexico. Um, it's located just south of the border with Arizona and has a, a lot of um, economic activity associated with, with the North American Free Trade uh, Act, or NAFTA. Um, even with the uh, current renegotiations with, with NAFTA partners, um, Sonora expects to grow uh, tremendously over the next, uh, the next few decades. And so clean sources of, of water and energy storage are, are, are needed. Um, many of you have probably heard about the, the incredibly low prices for solar that have been uh, achieved in Mexico's recent uh, uh, energy auctions. Um, this is a, a, a wonderful result of the, the evolution of, of solar and, and the reduction of costs associated with solar. Um, the, the, the downside is that there's now so much solar coming online in, in the state of Sonora that they're experiencing the same problems that California has experienced. Um, and so energy storage is a, is a tremendously uh, needed uh, asset um, in the state of Sonora. And so um, I think as, as solar rolls out uh, globally, uh, we will see uh, the need for storage grow. Um, and again, the economics of storage are very important um, to ensure that, that ultimately the low cost uh, energy is, is realized. Um, the water in Sonora can be used for, for high value agricultural as well as domestic purposes. Um, as in, and lastly, the, the application of uh, EFROS for, for mining um, to help clean up um, existing mines, to help them operate more efficiently and more environmentally um, sensitively is a, has a tremendous application and Oceanus is looking at, at partnering with mines um, in Mexico and in Chile to help uh, help uh, relieve the impact of mines on water systems and energy systems. So there's a there's a, a incredible opportunity there to to improve the the mining the mining industry. As I mentioned, uh, the team that we've assembled has a tremendous uh, depth of experience in um, infrastructure, energy, uh, water, um, and um, and uh, in, and and are prepared to to roll this uh, solution out uh, globally. We welcome communications from any or all of you uh, to uh, to understand the need for EFROS in in your particular countries and um, see if there's uh, opportunities for uh, for us to work together. Thank you very much for your time. Great, Neil, thank you. Uh, real quickly, this is Vicki Healy. Before we launch into our question and answer session, Jennifer, I just wanted to alert you that some very good questions came in through the chat function, which I forwarded to you. So if you open up your chat box, you will see some questions in there um, for our panelists. Great, thank you. Okay. Well, thank you to each of these panelists for their outstanding presentation. As we shift to the Q&A, I'd like to remind the attendees to please submit any questions using the question pane at any time. We will also keep several links up on the screen throughout 
for quick reference that point to where to find information about upcoming and previously held webinars, and also how to take advantage of the Exkin Expert program. We have some great questions from the audience that we'll use with the remaining time to answer and discuss. So the first question for the panel is, what has been the reaction of government to the IFPROS model? Are you looking for any of us to, to jump in on this? Yeah, yeah, please do. Okay, um, I'll, I'll take a swing. So this is Neil Aronson again. Um, in our experience, uh, governments have been very uh, supportive of, of the idea of IFROS um, in, in the regions that we've worked in so far. Um, in most cases, and particularly in Mexico, the water is uh, uh, really a, a government um, responsibility. Uh, Canagua is the federal uh, water agency, um, and each state has a, has a state version of Canagua, typically uh, known as uh, SEA. Um, they have been very, very supportive of the idea of, of uh, lower cost, uh, resilient water supplies. Um, and so uh, we've had uh, very, very warm welcomes um, in Mexico and Chile and other locations that we've started to look at. Great. Any other thoughts on that question from the panel? Yeah, I'll just jump in that we've also had a lot of um, interest from countries in the Middle East. Um, Jordan has reached out to us and um, Professor Slocum's actually um, gone and visited with a couple of the governments to try and see uh, how feasible some of these systems might be to meet their needs. So there, we've also seen a lot of interest on our end. Great. Okay, thank you. So moving on to the next question, this is more regarding financing of these projects, and there's two related questions. One would be, how could a private-public partnership work to develop a project such as this? And then secondly, could an international finance institution um, have a supportive model for IFCROS uh, applications? So just generally speaking, what does the financing look like and what options might there be to get these systems up and running? Uh, I'll take the first stab at this one. Um, we, we think a, a PPP or P3 model um, could apply to the development of EFROS uh, very well. Uh, it, it, there, there's, I think, a, some educational aspects of this that are required um, to, to get governments up to speed on, on this solution. It, it, is a, it is a new solution, even though both technologies are proven and bankable and and have been around for for decades. No one has actually um, developed a, an EFRO system yet, um, at least not at, at, at a utility scale um, that the, a, a P3 uh, would be would be focused on. Um, but uh, we we in Mexico we are we are working with the governments. Um, it's not a P3 per se, but it could be quickly adapted from the structure that we're in, currently working on uh, into a P3 structure. Uh, so I think it would be a, a, a good a good way to advance the rollout of EFROS uh, uh, in many markets. Um, the the idea of of uh, world bank type of financial institutions being involved or, or even you know low, more regionally focused um, uh, banks um, uh, multi you know multinational banks being involved in 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 this type of project is is uh, very intriguing for us um, we've had some very good conversations with World Bank and IFC um, and uh, NADB and so forth um, one of the challenges that we've had with these organizations is again that it, this is this is new and nobody has done this before, um, and so I think once one of these EFROS projects is completed, then uh, and, and then at that point the, these these global financial institutions will be more open to um, advancing. Um, their support of, of the projects, but again, the the first one is is always a uh, is always a little bit harder uh, until it's until it's done. 
Great, thank you. Any other thoughts from the panel? Just okay. a quick comment on, on what Neil said. I think he's absolutely right. I mean, the issue is it hasn't been done before, but looking at this concept, and this is, you know, we've had, had this conversation for a couple of months now with the people at MIT. And it really looks now the aisle of, of a multilateral bank. Uh, it's just that it seems new and, and it's interesting because it's not. And all these technologies are proven and the monster, but there is, there is no um, experiment, experimentation here. But, you know, uh, I, I think IFI sometimes take a little longer to, 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 to make that shift and to look at new solutions. But World Bank just came out with a very interesting uh, analysis and a study on the water energy nexus. And they focused on their project of the last five years on water and on energy and how these two are interlinked and they are intertwined in a way. So hopefully, uh, you know, uh, you know, there will be a change in this uh, uh, shift in, in, on the part of IFIs and others. Great, thank you. Okay, on to our next question. It seems like we have some interest to learn more about the environmental impact of the East Coast technology, as well as what is meant by benign brine. So if we could discuss that a little bit more, that would be helpful. Sure. Um, but now, so in, I think the, the reference to benign brine was in my, was in my uh, slide deck. Um, what, what we mean by that is uh, a, a reduction in, the, in the, the concentration of the brine discharge from the desal facility. Uh, when, you, when you desal water uh, for, every, for every cubic meter of water that you uh, push through the membranes, uh, approximately half of it comes out as fresh water and, and the other half comes out as a, as a twice concentrated um, brine solution. Uh, and then uh, and that, that brine solution by itself is a, is a toxic uh, component or a toxic additive into the marine environment um, that currently in most places around the world is, is uh, diluted very little before it's injected back into the marine environment. Um, the nature of the integration of EFROS enables us to, to blend that brine back into the outflow of the pump storage system, um, and it reduces that, the, the concentration of that brine uh, back down to within 5 or 10% of ambient salinity or the, or the typical ocean salinity. Uh, and so it becomes a, a benign, a more benign, uh, brine discharge than uh, than you would have in a in a typical desal facility. So that's so that's the that's the reference that uh, that you saw in the in the deck. A uh, benign brine is a is a lower much much lower concentration uh, brine discharge, which has a, effectively a zero or minimal, I should say, impact on the marine environment, and is is further diluted all the way to ambient salinity by wave and tidal action. Um, another thing I'd like to add is that um, while we were looking at all these different sites um, for possible IFRO uh, systems, we made sure to look at areas that already had um, sort of like big indentations at elevation. So it, we made sure that you didn't have to do a whole lot of digging to get that reservoir. There's sort of already a natural barrier there that you could use um, with minimal additional construction to try and limit some of the environmental um, impacts. Another thing is that many of the regions we looked at have been dealing with prolonged droughts that have had devastating effects to the local um, environment. And so you can imagine that perhaps we can set aside a small portion of the water generated for human consumption um, and actually pump it back to replenish some of the mountain streams and ponds and wildlife in the area so there could be a net positive environmental impact. Um, and finally, we also looked a little bit at um, what the effect of cycling all this water up to such a high location would be on the, uh, on the geography and the, and the earth in the area. Um, and we found that when you compare the effect of 
all this weight of this water moving around to some of the uses we already do for water, such as um, fracking um, or geothermal power, where we, we send a lot of water deep. We believe that the effects would be minimal compared to some of those. And unlike fracking, which has been shown to possibly uh, increase chances of earthquakes, um, and we already do that a lot. Um, we don't, at least in the United States, we don't think that uh, such systems would be um, nearly as impactful as some of the, well, these IFRO systems would be nearly as impactful as some of these um, water uses we already do to our natural environment. So while we do think that there should be considerations taken for each location specifically when, when building a system, overall we, we anticipate more of a net benefit to the environment rather than um, an impact, negative impact. Thank you, Maha. I guess as a variation on that theme, we've also had a question regarding noise levels associated with the technology, with the RO facility during operation. Um, I don't know if that's an issue, but that's been asked. Just generally, reverse osmosis um, is not a silent process. Um, typically, the noise is contained within a within a building, um, but it is an industrial process, and so uh, you do hear um, significant noise with inside the building. Um, I would suggest that most of that noise is associated with the with the typical smaller pumps associated with with traditional desal, uh, and so. Through the EFROS process, you're reducing or really eliminating all of those small pumps. Um, you're using the head from the elevation, um, and so the the noise is dramatically reduced. Um, but it's still an industrial facility, an infrastructure facility, so there 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 is some residual noise. Um, pump storage as well. Um, inside the pump house is a, has some significant noise, um, but on the surface. Um, where, say, the public might be, or visitors, or right, uh, other co nearby communities, there's there's very little noise associated with the facility. Great, thank you. We have another question. Do you see an opportunity to partner with aquaponics with an IFPRO technology, and that type of project that could be deployed? Um, yeah, we absolutely think that there there could be some symbiosis um, in the in the IFRO system to produce food, um, whether that be through aquaponics or through some sort of aquaculture deployments. Um, a lot of these systems just require some space um, in in water, um, and you could we could definitely see some uh, symbiosis happening there. Yeah, I would agree. Um, whether it's uh, aquaponics or aquaculture or even agriculture um, in, the, in the immediately uh, adjacent regions, um, particularly high value agriculture such as um, um, peppers, tomatoes, um, things like that uh, that have um, high nutrient loads and so forth for uh, human consumption typically uh, are, are great combinations um, uh, to, to, to integrate with these facilities. And in fact, in Mexico and Sonora, we're looking at, at teaming up with some local organic farms um, immediately adjacent to the facility. Thank you. We have another question. Um, I guess, would there be other applications of IFPROS? Obviously recognizing there would need to be some changes, but to more in the applications, um, are you looking maybe working with brackish water sources instead of seawater. Uh, just wanted to get a sense of the applicability, if at all. Absolutely. Uh, I, Go oh, ahead, sorry. Maha, please. No, uh, um, I, I think it, uh, it definitely could be, and I think the big question is just a matter of how much water. It's just the volume of water or brackish solution or what have you that is able to be pumped up to a reasonable height. Um, for power generation or, or water production. So I just think, I think at that point, just quantities of, of how much is available and what makes economical sense. 
So, so we've looked at uh, inland locations and opportunities, as I mentioned, in the mining industry, for example. Um, we have a, a system we've designed to treat uh, tailing pond water, actually, um, which, uh, which is a huge problem for mines right now, um, both in terms of the environmental uh, impact of, of tailing ponds and tailing water on groundwater sources or, or spills, uh, but also on the, 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 the energy required to do that. And so um, we do believe EFROS has applications in the mining industry that are economic today. Um, other other uh, contaminated water sources, whether it's groundwater or, or surface water contaminated um, by agriculture or, or other uh, issues um, can be treated cost effectively with EFROS systems. Um, we've actually even looked at uh, Mexico City, um, which if, if you're familiar with the Mexico City and the, and the water issues the, the city has, um, they, they sit basically right on top of their, their own aquifer, um, which only supplies a very small portion of, of water. Um, that water itself is, is being contaminated by the, the city's um, existence, I guess. Um, and so they're forced to, to pump water uh, from lower elevations, clean water from lower elevations up to serve the city's um, water needs. And that has a tremendous cost uh, associated with it moving that water up the hill. So we've, we've looked at solutions whereby we are able to treat the, the water uh, locally at elevation within the, the Mexico City um, region and deliver it back to the, to, to the city's water systems for, for use. And we believe we can do that uh, very cost effectively. Um, and this same, this same application can be, uh, can be applied um, in many regions of the, of the world. Um, also, for example, in California, we have uh, situations where there are um, uh, aquifers contaminated with, with agricultural uh, chemicals um, that we can treat cost effectively and, and either return the water back into the groundwater systems into the aquifers or deliver it to the to the uh, irrigation or, or potable water systems in the immediate uh, area so so absolutely there's applications beyond uh, seawater desalination thank you great I think we have one final question, and just a general about what is the outlook of the water energy nexus from a political and financial perspective? Uh, and so I, I guess any open-ended thoughts on political or financial drivers and perspectives on the water energy nexus? I'd like to start uh, with a, a view, a political view on it, or from the policy perspective. I mean, it seems that what this EFROS system offers is, is is a solution to a problem of many countries and I can cite a few like for example in the Caribbean countries such as Barbados has a tremendous issue with uh, water desalination for human consumption and uh, so looking at a solution such as this one may be part of the um, uh, you know, future solution for the country. Uh, obviously, there is a, an issue also, I was looking at the presentation offered um, with altitude, so you need a certain height to, to elevate the water and then to, to, to function as a reservoir for energy. You know, but the same, I see the same future in Central America, for example, Panama is one of the countries that has been very focused on the water energy nexus and we've had many conversations with them about this issue. And again, this is a case where, of a country uh, whose interest in, in, in analysis in the analysis of the nexus and uh, addressing solutions and challenges in energy and water through the nexus may be a country where we can look at uh, how to work on this. I think you know this system has many solutions and many answers. Uh, um, you know, even in this presentation, I, I'm familiar with this concept. I've had some conversations about it with with. Uh, with the oceanus with with the people at MIT but even in this presentation and, and with some of the questions asked by the participants I realize how much potential this has and again as I was saying before uh, you know it doesn't seem yet that maybe some financial mechanisms or multilateral banks and so on are ready for it yet because they haven't seen it 
work, we all know that all the technologies that are being used in this in this process are proven technologies available in the public domain. So there is no issue of patenting. Um, but you know they haven't seen it yet. I think that as the first projects break ground, then then there will be a, a better predisposition for these types of projects, and especially if we want to envisage projects at the uh, at the utility scale, which which is even um, harder in terms of terms of investments and, and risk. Um, but I, from the perspective of policy and the discussions that we've been having with member states under the Energy and Climate Partnership of the Americas umbrella and at the Organization of American States, you know, the future looks promising. I think that the key issue here will be to show uh, the cost feasibility, the financial resilience of the model, and based on that, then I think, you know, money will start flowing into these types of uh, endeavors and development. Thank you. Any other closing thoughts on that? All right. Well, thank you again to the panelists for this informative question and answer session. For any questions we didn't have time to get to, we will connect with those attendees offline after the webinar. Now I'd like to provide the panelists with an opportunity to provide any additional or closing remarks that you'd like to make before we close the webinar. Any additional thoughts? I'd just like to say thank you and I hope uh, folks in the webinar have been, are as excited about this kind of technology as I am. Yeah, I'd appreciate uh, uh, the opportunity to thank everybody as well uh, for, for joining and listening. Um, I want to thank uh, Dr. Hodge and, and her team and uh, Dr. Slocum at MIT for, uh, for, for advancing this and, and publicizing EFROS um, as they have. It's been a tremendous uh, boost to the, to the industry. Um, and I would welcome any uh, outreach from, from any of the attendees with additional questions or uh, opportunities for EFROS developments uh, in, their, in their countries. Same as Neil and Maha. I, I, I thank you both for, for participating and presenting on, on EFROS and uh, your development in, in, in Mexico. Um, uh, we will follow up with any questions from uh, participants uh, on this um, on this webinar, and we hope that we can work uh, on future actions uh, under the EGBA umbrella and under the auspices of the Organization of American States. Also, thank you to the Clean Energy Solutions Center. Above everyone, Vicky Healy, who facilitated the the, the webinar. Great, thank you again. On behalf of the Solution Center, I'd like to extend a thank you to all of our expert panelists and to our attendees for participating in today's webinar. We very much appreciate your time and hope in return there were some valuable insights that you can take back to your ministries, departments, or organizations. We also invite you to inform your colleagues and those in your networks about Solution Center resources and services, including no-cost policy support through our Ask an Expert service. I invite you to check the Solution Center website if you'd like to view the slides and listen to a recording of today's presentations, as well as previously held webinars. Additionally, you will find information on upcoming webinars and other training events. We are also now posting webinar recordings to the Clean Energy Solution Center YouTube channel. Please allow for one week for the audio recording to be posted. I would like to kindly ask you to take a moment to complete the short survey that will appear when we conclude the webinar. Please enjoy the rest of your day, and we hope to see you again at future Clean Energy Solutions Center events. This concludes our webinar.